my name is uh, Michiel Bork, and uh, also known as Bork Dude on the internet. And yeah. hey. <laughs> and um, I'm probably most known for uh, a tool called Babeshka and Salia Kondo. Those are the two two most popular tools. But today, uh, I want to start the talk with uh, uh, something about Babeshka. What is it about Babeshka that uh, makes it like a relatively popular uh, tool for scripting in Clojure. Uh, it's hard to say, but I, I think a few of the, the aspects are, uh, about it are uh, it's lightweight, uh, as in it consumes uh, not a lot of memory. So it, it similar to Bash it, for scripting, it's lightweight. Um, and it starts fast, like Bash. So um, and it's easy to install. You just download a single binary and you can run it and that's it. So there is no complicated uh, story there. And uh, also it comes with batteries included with like 80% of what you need for scripting is already uh, there most of the time. So, um, so I was wondering if we could uh, repeat this Babeshka uh, recipe, let's say, in another uh, domain. So Babeshka replaces Bash scripts. What, what more can we come up with around this theme of making a small closure runtime from a bigger closure runtime? Because Babeshka is built in closure in the big JVM closure uh, runtime to make a smaller, more focused, and a more single purpose uh, tool. So um, can we fulfill similar use cases with a similar uh, uh, approach. What about closure script? Um, and don't know about you, but my timeline on Twitter is constantly bombarded with all kinds of new JavaScript things. And um, I, I'm under the impression and that this could be totally biased by the Twitter algorithm that JavaScript is becoming more popular and not less popular. <laughs> uh, and if we're going to survive climate change, then we're stuck with JavaScript forever. So let's assume that, that, that we will solve that, that problem. Uh, but I will focus on, on JavaScript. So uh, Closure Script is awesome. Uh, we all already heard something about Mike Fikes and uh, David Nolan. Uh, the, these two are, are the main dudes about, uh, behind Closure Script. Um, and I'm happy that it exists and I'm not here to criticize Closure Script. Uh, so I think sh closure script should should stay the way that it is, uh, but I'm here to propose some new tools that we can create with closure script. Um, so closure script targets JavaScript uh, uh, using closure. Uh, it comes with Google Closure as an advanced whole program optimizer. So what you do with uh, closure script typically is make applications, uh, so front end applications typically. Um, and not so much uh, libraries that you uh, uh, put on NPM for other JavaScript users to use. That's typically not a use case that we see for Closure Script. Um, and I, I think it's fair to say that, that Closure Script is used mostly from, from the JVM. Uh, I think 99% of the people who do front end applications with Closure Script use the JVM, the compiler in the JVM. Although uh, there is also self-hosted closure script, which means that the compiler can run in a JavaScript runtime. Uh, but um, yeah, it's, it's sometimes um, uh, there are trade-offs. So if you use self-hosted, uh, you compile it to a front-end application and you do some evaluation in the front-end, for example. Uh, there is still like, and you include some dependencies, there is like eight megabytes of JavaScript, uh, which is not advanced. Uh, compiled because self-hosted doesn't support that. Um, so are there any opportunities that we can uh, uh, fulfill with some new smaller tools? So these are some of the things that I came up with. You might have other things that, that you think that Closure Script can maybe also support. Um, so, so one thing is uh, support for ES6 modules. ES6 is a format in JavaScript, uh, a standard now, in which you describe uh, which fun functions you import and which functions you export. Um, and this is now a standard module uh, format, but Closure Script or actually Google 
closure in general doesn't play well uh, with uh, compiling ES6 code which can then be processed with other uh, JavaScript tooling. Um, because, yeah, reasons that I will go into later. Uh, so async await is something that JavaScript added to the language in recent years. Um, and it's uh, convenient to use that in JavaScript. Everybody uses that now. But we cannot use this from ClojureScript. Uh, it's, yeah, it's uh, impossible. Uh, so what, uh, what you can do with scripting tools like Babeshka is you, you just throw a little bit of closure at it and you can execute it without any uh, like project setup ceremony. Uh, and I think we could make something for ClojureScript that supports that as well. Uh, to compile smaller snippets without like having a lot of ceremony. Uh, so for, so JVM is great. I don't want to get rid of JVM, but uh, there is this vast JavaScript ecosystem that uh, doesn't know anything about the JVM. And I think we will win some new people for the closure script ecosystem if we can also run just on, let's say node or whatever. So why not target both uh, systems? Uh, JSX is something that a lot of JavaScript uh, tools now support. Um, so yeah, we, in, in ClojureScript, we typically use something like Hiccup to describe HTML elements. And uh, then we have macros which try to optimize things and stuff. But we could also just try to emit JSX directly and then make the optimization of all these HTML elements the problem of the JavaScript tooling, which is uh, being worked on a lot. Um, so I already mentioned that we could maybe find a way to compile ClojureScript libraries and put them on, on NPM so other JavaScript projects can directly use them without exporting the standard ClojureScript library to every library that we ship to NPM, because that's a little bit of a waste to, to uh, if you use two libraries that are compiled with ClojureScript to pull in the standard library twice. Uh, and I think there are some improvements for uh, interop. So <clears throat> uh, the first half of my talk will be about uh, SCI, what we can do with SCI in ClojureScript to make uh, fun little tools. Um, and SCI is a small closure interpreter which also forms uh, the basis uh, behind Babeshka. So it, it runs on, on the JVM, as we see here, closure. And then we require sci.core and we evaluate a string. And that returns 6 plus 1 to 3. But the same thing works in closure script. So uh, here we start closure script in a REPL uh, on node. We require sci.core. And we get the same thing. So the interface uh, of Psi is more or less the same for closure and closure scripts. Of course, there are some differences imposed by the host. But uh, yeah, it's, it's more or less the same thing. So theoretically, you could make a scripting tool like Babeshka, but for the JavaScript ecosystem. And that's uh, what NBB became. So NBB is uh, short for Node Babeshka. I will go into that tool in the, in the next slides. But there are also some other tools that, that you might know about, not know about. Uh, Skittle and Joyride I, I will also show. But there are al also some tools like Forever Closure, which is a static website which runs some JavaScript uh, in which you can uh, do foreclosure exercises. And uh, Clerk is a notebook library for closure in which you can uh, write viewers, viewer function, which gets executed in your browser, which is also using Psy. Uh, and there are a lot more of these uh, tools that use the small closure interpreter in the browser, let's say, to, to, to have interactive closure uh, evaluation. So first a little bit uh, about uh, NBB. So NBB aims to provide closure script scripting on Node.js. Uh, so what we see here, uh, if you have NPM installed on your computer, then there is a tool called NPX, and NPX uh, lets you execute an, an entry point from a, from a project. 
So if you type npx nbb, nbb is a dependency on npm, then it will uh, try to download this dependency and then uh, you get a REPL. So this is all you need to do if you have npm installed to get a closure REPL, which is interpreted by Psi, so it's not the real closure, but it's close enough, uh, especially I think for people who are just starting out to learn things about closure. Um, so this is all you need to do now if you have npm installed, npx, nbd, and that's it. So we require here uh, some, some node library, and we call a function from it. But uh, nbb also comes with things you expect from core to be available. Uh, for example, we have closure math. Where have we seen that before today? Uh, and it, yeah, so IE, I triple E rem remainder, uh, blah, 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 and you get a number. So that just works. Um, so, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, so what do we do with, uh, so async await is normally the thing you use in JavaScript to deal with uh, asynchronous programming. That's not what Psy currently supports, but NBB comes with a library called uh, Promessa, and Promessa uh, contains a lot of macros that are similar to closure uh, built-in macros like do and let uh, to, to let you deal with asynchronous code uh, as if it's synchronous code. So we see a functioneer called do stuff, which prints hello, and then we have p delay thousand, which means sleep thousand milliseconds, and then we do the next print, and then we return 16. So this function, if you call it, it returns a promise that resolves to 16 uh, after waiting one second. So if you run that from the REPL, you get back a promise and you will see some print lines. Uh, but there is also plet, which is like closure let, and that lets you pull out values from promises and then do stuff with that. So if you call do stuff in plet, and you get back x, then x is equal to 16 here, and then you can increment x, you get y, so not everything has to be a promise, you can also mix with uh, normal values, and then we wait another second and we print something and then we return y. And NBB has one uh, special construct for top level await, which is not, uh, this is not available in normal closure script, but it's just for making working with the REPL uh, easier in NBB. So you can say await and then a promise and then the REPL will block uh, on, the, on the promise and you get the content <coughs> of the promise directly instead of the promise itself. So this is really convenient if you, if you work with the REPL. So uh, there is a, a, a nice framework available for, uh, and for Node, uh, which is called Sidefox. It's a closure script web framework for Node and it works with NBB. Um, and it's, uh, it has also has a template so you can type something like npx create uh, sidefox app or whatever and then uh, you have a, like a, some boilerplate for your new site. It's just a couple of lines of code and it's very nice for small projects. So you want to, to save something to a small database or whatever and, and have one admin screen or, uh, or uh, yeah and it doesn't get like uh, huge traffic. Uh, you can uh, deploy multiple of these sites to the same virtual uh, private server uh, because it doesn't use a, a lot of resources. So it's, it's very nice for that type of use case. It's, it's not suited for everything, of course, but uh, at least we, we, I think with all these tools, we're creating a migration path. So, so people who are just coming in uh, see these tools, easy to use, uh, they start experimenting and maybe eventually they will outgrow these tools and, and migrate to like the bigger closure script with shadow sales, yes, or, or whatever. But at least we offered these people like a way to grow into the, the ecosystem. Uh, oh, so uh, AW, uh, sorry, yeah, NBB is very suitable for writing AWS lambdas. It's just a five lines of code uh, and uh, Ray was sitting there in the audience uh, wrote a nice ar uh, blog article about it, so if you want to know uh, more about that, go visit that blog article. And um, there is also a blog article which goes deeper into this with an example uh, where the author built um, 
two lambdas, one for saving statistics about his uh, blog into an AWS database, and the, one, the other lambda renders like the st statistics. And since AWS Lambda, uh, the first million or, or so requests are free. So if you don't have a hugely popular uh, blog, then you basically get uh, these analytics for free. Or, it, and if you do have a hugely popular blog, you have probably uh, money to pay uh, <laughs> this <laughs> Lambda too. So, <laughs> um, so Playwright is another nice tool from the uh, Node ecosystem. It also exists uh, for other languages. But uh, for NBB, it's, it's pretty nice to write UI tests using this uh, Playwright tool. Um, so there, yeah, you can go to the example afterwards. Uh, just want to mention that. And there is a tool, a new tool that you might not be f uh, familiar with, which is called Bun. And it's a Node.js uh, Node alternative which focuses on better performance. Uh, it, so in some cases, it, yeah, they have very impressive uh, performance improvements compared to Node.js. And uh, what it also has, uh, it has a built-in support for uh, FFI. So if you say, okay, I have um, SQLite on my system, I can say here, okay, lib SQLite, and I describe uh, a, fu a function in that library using, uh, okay, it takes no arguments, but it returns a C string. So this is what you have to declare to be able to talk to this C library. And afterwards you can here, you can call this C library. And, but we can do this stuff from the REPL uh, in NBB. So it's pretty nice uh, that we can do this low level kind of programming from a dynamically typed and very flexible REPL oriented uh, language. Uh, so this is one use case that Bun uh, opens up, I think, for the, for the ClojureScript ecosystem. Might be nice to keep an eye on this. Uh, there's also uh, Facebook is working on a machine learning library uh, that works in Bun. So that's also pretty interesting. Maybe not now because it's pretty experimental, but maybe in a few years uh, we'll be moving some stuff from Python to, to this. I don't know. It's, uh, yeah, but then we can use it from ClojureScript, which seems a win to me. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, more about NBB you can find in a talk at, uh, uh, at the London Clojureans last, uh, I don't know, when was it? Six months ago. Um, so go watch that talk if you want to know more about NBB. Let's move on. Um, another tool that was built using the small Clojure interpreter was, uh, is called Skittle. And Skittle, with a C, SCI, uh, allows you to evaluate ClojureScript directly from browser tags. Uh, so we don't have to compile our ClojureScript first, but you can just write a, a plain HTML file, and then we have a script tag here, which says ac application x Skittle. And, oh yeah, and here ha we have a script tag that says source, and then you can load Skittle from a CDN. So here we, d we have a script tag, uh, and here we have a function which says JS alert you clicked. And here I attach that function to a button. And so this is all in the same website. So if you click this button, this alert will appear. So this is the most basic example that, that you can, can do. Uh, but we can go a step further. So there was uh, someone who made a Wordle game. And uh, his challenge was to write this Wordle game in ClojureScript without React. So he used Shadow Sail yes for this and then compiled it to JavaScript, deployed it to some, some website. Uh, but I tried it with Skittle and it worked. Uh, so what Skittle here does, it, it has a script tag which refers directly to the raw GitHub content blah 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 uh, .sail.js file without compiling it. And so you can see that uh, here it loads this, this uh, Wordle closure script main Wordle core 2 sail.js. This is a tiny, this is only the top of the file. But then if, yeah, if you define like the right uh, app uh, or div ID is app and, and some CSS in your web page and you load that closure script, then it works, then you have a, a Wordle game. So that's fun. Um, uh, yeah, so there is a reagent plugin for Skittle. So you can uh, include another 
uh, another script tag here, skittle.reagent, but you also have to provide your own version of React uh, because it's all optional. I want to, to give uh, like modularity that you don't have to include everything, but you can include reagent and then you, here is a reagent snippet that you can uh, include in your script tag and now we have a reagent component that works. So this is all the setup you have to do. No uh, project or, or whatever, just an HTML file. Uh, this is a fun example on GoPen, uh, with, again with reagent and this, uh, yeah, I don't know exactly what this represents, uh, but Paula suggested that, that this were my GitHub commits. But <laughs> that's, not, that's not what it is, uh, at least I don't think so. But, uh, so this, but now we have ClojureScript running on CodePen that was also a first with uh, Skittle uh, without any uh, like <coughs> compilation. So it's just, you can try things out and uh, yeah, I think it's nice for getting started on smaller uh, projects that you, you're not sure if, it worth, is, if it's worth setting up the uh, project skeleton for. So uh, more on Skittle, uh, recently uh, apropos, uh, did something on Skittle. Um, so again, Ray, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> and uh, Mike and uh, other people uh, of the Apropos crew. Uh, so if you want to know more, then maybe uh, watch that uh, episode. So let's move on. So another thing that, uh, this is the last thing with Sci today. Uh, so another thing that uh, was created in the, re in the last half year is called Joyride. And Joyride is a VS Code extension. Um, and uh, I did this together with uh, Peter Stromberg for, from Calva uh, to make VS Code hackable in the same way that you can hack uh, Emacs with Elisp. Uh, but now we can use ClojureScript, which is argu arguably even better. Um, <laughs> okay, so an example uh, of a script. So this is, if you install uh, Joyride, it will install some example scripts in your uh, project. And there is a Joyride folder with, uh, okay, so this is open document. So you require VS Code and joyride.core and Promessa is also available uh, here. Uh, and then there is a function show random example, which uh, opens a random script, example script of, of what that we deliver with Joyride. So if you execute this script in uh, VS Code, then, uh, okay, you get this pop-up, but so this just shows that you can use the VS Code <coughs> interrupt that you normally have to write a whole extension for, but now we can do it in a script instead of writing a whole extension and publishing it to, to the store. Um, so uh, yeah, Sin uh, in recent versions, you can also uh, use npm libraries from Joyride directly, so the whole npm ecosystem is also available to you. Uh, so yeah, we have Moment.js, and here we have Axios, which is uh, an HTTP client in Node. So you can all do this from your editor and to make your editor more convenient for yourself, like we're used to in Emacs. Um. <laughs> Okay, so if you want to know more about Joyride, uh, Peter and I are giving a talk end of uh, next month, again at the London Closureians. So moving on. So what about a smaller ClojureScript compiler? Can we make like, can we have similar convenience uh, by making a small compiler instead of an interpreter? Because there are some downsides, uh, there are some pros and some cons to an interpreter. One uh, pro is that, okay, you don't have to uh, emit any files and garbage to your, to your file system. And, but one downside is uh, you always have to bring the, the interpreter with you to execute this program. And also performance, uh, compiled programs are generally uh, more optimizable than, than interpreted programs. So, what if we can ma make something in this space? Uh, again, lightweight, fast to start, easy to install, and somewhat batteries included. Uh, that's what uh, two relatively new projects became. Uh, one is called Cherry, and the other is called Squint. Uh, so Cherry is for, uh, I cherry picked a lot of things from ClojureScript, and Squint is 
Okay, if you squint a little bit, it's very much like ClojureScript, but it's not, <laughs> it's not ClojureScript. So uh, that's how you can remember uh, what, it, what this is. So squint, or, or sorry, uh, I'll start with Cherry. Uh, so Cherry is ClojureScript, a ClojureScript compiler. Uh, and it comes with the immu immutable data structures. Uh, and uh, with the SailsJS core library, pre-compiled with Google Clojure to advanced compiled JavaScript into an NPM library that is available on NPM and shared with all compiled uh, Cherry programs. So this is how we avoid uh, shipping ClojureScript for every uh, library. Uh, but there is one downside that uh, the bundle size starts at 300 kilobytes, uh, 65 kilobyte gzip, which may not be a problem, but for some JavaScript people, they, they post all these benchmarks online all the time, and <coughs> then it may, may not be so uh, acceptable. But I'll, I'll go into detail uh, later. And Squint is uh, like Cherry, but it compiles directly to ClojureScript, uh, or sorry, sorry, JavaScript, and it doesn't uh, include any of the uh, ClojureScript core library, but it has its own core library implemented in JavaScript, which is lighter weight for smaller uh, bundle sizes. And if you write a map, in Squint, you get a JavaScript object and not like a ClojureScript map. So uh, it's, it comes with trade-offs, uh, but for some programs with heavy interop, th this can be also a nice uh, choice. Um, and both projects, they share common compiler code. Uh, th th these projects happened when I came across a project called Scripture, which already existed before ClojureScript came into existence, so this was a tiny library to uh, compile JavaScript snippets from Clojure as expressions. Um, and it happened to work with Babeshka, so then I became enthusiastic about this library. <laughs> and then I, I started playing around with this library, and then I saw the potential of doing like uh, more things with it, so then it evolved from, uh, then the idea got started. Uh, started. Okay. So let's talk about Cherry first. Um, so the idea about, uh, behind Cherry is that we can compile one ClojureScript file to one JavaScript file. So there is always a one-on-one -on -one correspondence. Uh, and this makes it very easy to reason about your project. Uh, like you can just inspect the compiled JavaScript and see how it compiles and uh, yeah, if that's the thing you, you want. You can install it from NPM, so you can just uh, say NPM install Cherry CLGS and then run it. Uh, or you can still run it from the JVM as well. It's built using CLGSC. So uh, it, it works with the JVM and also still it works with Babeshka. So, um, so like I told already, the, the closure script core functions are bundled in a, in a, a shared library on NPM, uh, which enables uh, you to share compiled code directly on NPM so JavaScript users can directly use it without invoking ClojureScript. Uh, there is no Google Clojure involved anymore when you compile with Cherry, but Cherry itself is made with the normal ClojureScript, so there is, uh, that's where Google Clojure is used. You can still uh, throw the compiled JavaScript at Clojure, Google Clojure, but that's completely optional. You don't have to do that. Uh, it has support for macros, uh, REPL. It's uh, not so uh, mature yet, but so that's uh, the REPL support, I mean. So that is still ongoing work. It supports async await. There is no special uh, like Promessa library needed anymore. You can just write async await. Uh, native support for destructuring and also uh, in, for JavaScript objects. And there is uh, JSX uh, support built in. So uh, I'll show how, what that looks like. Uh, to, if we compile a simple ClojureScript file to an uh, MJS, which stands for module JS, which is like nodes indication of this is ES6. So here we have a file called example.sailjs, and this is the contents. So we have NS example defn foo x, which uh, associates foo true to a, a map. And then we call prn foo with an empty map. And this, of course, prints foo true. Uh, 
And if you have Cherry installed, you can just say npx cherry run example.cls. This compiles the file and then it runs the file. So there is also a mode where you just compile it, of course, for front end, for example. But for scripting, this is uh, convenient so you can do the compilation and running in one go. Um, and this is what the contents of this file uh, looks like. So as you can see, in, in this example, we use a soch, and here we import a soch from the shared library on NPM. And this, this is done for every core function that you use. So again, for a keyword, because we have to construct a keyword here, uh, and the function PRN and array map, because if you create an empty map, that's an array map by default in, in ClojureScript. So this is the, these are the imports from the shared uh, library on NPM. And then uh, this is the foo function, which uh, calls a soch and the keyword foo. And then here we call PRN. So that's what it looks like. Uh, yes. So what about the JavaScript tool chain? Can we uh, throw this JavaScript add a random uh, JavaScript tool and can it then process it for uh, like bundling. And, and so bundling is like making a single file from all the JavaScript files and optimizing it for size. So uh, ESBuild is a popular tool in the, in the JavaScript ecosystem. And if we bundle it, uh, then we get a, a file of 300 kilobytes, which is not so optimal, but I will explain why this is. But uh, it is standalone, so if you throw this file uh, like to another computer that doesn't have Cherry it, and you run it with Node, it, it works because it's fully standalone. So that's pretty nice. So to do this, to be able to use await, uh, we have to indicate that this is an asynchronous function. This is not something that I invented. This is something you have to do in JavaScript as well. You have to write async function, blah, blah, blah. So that's, uh, we do, yeah. So. I use metadata here to not invent like a custom syntax because I also wrote CLD condo and I, I don't want to chase CLD condo. <laughs> so, and the, this is also why I chose JS slash await and not like normal uh, await with the prefix because then I have to change CLD condo to tell it that await exists. But this might change in the future if, if this, this gets too, too annoying. Then, then I'll change CLD condo. So, <laughs> Uh, okay, so and so fetch closure uh, returns a promise, uh, so we can await that promise again. So then we get the text, and then we get it can get a substring from this text, and we can print it. So we can now do npx cherry run example, and then we see doc type HTML blah blah blah. So that that works. Uh, so we can now do async await in ClojureScript, at least a dialect of ClojureScript. Uh, yeah, okay, so, so JSX, an example. Uh, so here we have NS example require React DOM server, refer render to readable stream. So this is actually a server side program which does some pre-rendering of a, of a React component. And so let's first write this React component. We say def an app. And here we see uh, some special, also using metadata constructs which can destructure a JavaScript object directly. Um, so if you hint that, okay, this is a JavaScript object, you can use keys destructuring to, to get some value out of a JavaScript object. And here we see a special uh, reader macro called JSX, which indicates that the, the, the data that follows is actually a JSX form and not like uh, just a vector with keywords. Um, so in JavaScript, normally if you write JSX and you want to embed expressions, then you have to escape it again with some curly braces. But here I chose to, to break the JSX uh, uh, expression if you just use a, a, a non-vector with, uh, so you're not using a vector but a regular expression, so you're now back into ClojureScript. And if you then want to introduce JSX again, you just write JSX again. So, and this is the normal hiccup that we're used to from uh, reagent and whatnot. But now we're not using any custom uh, library to deal with React, we're using React directly and emitting some JSX. So here, uh, so this is a way uh, 
to describe, okay, I'm going to build an app on port 3000, and this is actually supported in BUN, the tool that I just mentioned, to, to start a web server and to, uh, to run a function in that web server. So it, it has built-in support for, uh, for this, but also for JSX. So if I compile a file to JSX, which I did here, npx cherry compile and then uh, bun example JSX, this is the, what we see in the browser. So this is all the code that we needed to get a pre-rendering for a React component without, without any other libraries but uh, React itself. So uh, front-end example. Uh, so there are many front-end solutions. I cannot keep up with what, what, what happens in the JavaScript ecosystem. So I rather focus on this tool and then make it work with all these uh, frameworks. Uh, but there is Next.js, there is Vite or Vite, I don't know how to pronounce it. There is Solid.js, uh, but all these tools have their own ways of, of dealing, uh, solving problems like hot reloading uh, and bundling. And this is all, so as long as you provide some JavaScript that these tools understand, uh, you're good. So here we have a similar example, but now it's uh, a counter example. So if you click on uh, this button, it will uh, render range, but then with an incremented number each time. So <coughs> zero to nine. So, um, so this is very similar as what we saw before, um, but this is now a front-end application. Uh, so if we compile the, the, the uh, oh yeah, you can just use React hooks like your, uh, so there is no special support. We're just using React. No uh, libraries, other libraries. So if we compile this to a production uh, website that we want to deploy uh, on our, uh, to our customers, then we're still, uh, again, left with this 300 kilobytes thing for this small example, which might be okay, but, but maybe not so optimal for, uh, for people who want more. Um, okay, but I urge you to compare the, the JavaScript bundle that you have right now with ClojureScript, so you might already be far beyond that and then it's maybe not, not a problem. But some people in the JavaScript ecosystem are like fighting each other on the small, I have the smallest. <laughs> so, uh, so, um, oh, yes, yeah. So why do we have 300 kilobytes as a baseline? How, okay, yeah. Um, a, so, Google Clojure uh, compiles ClojureScript basically to uh, per namespace to a global object. Uh, and ES6 tooling doesn't understand that you're only using some things from this Google uh, global object. So it leaves this whole global object into your uh, Clojure, in your JavaScript. Um, and there might be a solution to this. There is an open issue for this with some, somebody who studied like the structure of this global thing and we might be able to rewrite it, uh, but uh, it's, it's a topic of research, so if you're interested in looking into this, this is the issue number, 24 on Squint Sale JS Cherry. That's uh, also where you can find this library. Uh, I'll have to hurry up a little bit. Um, so there is another uh, variant of Cherry, but this is basically a rewrite in pure JS, pure JavaScript. Uh, well, not the compiler, but the standard library so that all the bundling works uh, more optimal. So, uh, so if you have the similar example that I just showed with Cherry, but then write it with uh, Squint, which is like the JavaScript, pure JavaScript variant, then we're left with uh, five kilobytes of JavaScript, or four and a half kilobytes, which is even smaller than the fav icon that they shipped with this uh, <laughs> framework. So um, squint, this is how it looks again, but if you now write a map, it's a JavaScript object and not a ClojureScript thing. So uh, be aware uh, that this is the trade-off. You're uh, using mutable objects with all the pitfalls that come with JavaScript. Uh, but if we throw this at ESBuild, then we're left with 1.4 kilobytes and not 300. Uh, so the squint core library is, it was a fun uh, thing to write. We wrote it in pure JavaScript, 
to be able to, to, to make it understandable to these tools be because we could not do it through Google Closure. I did it together with uh, Will Acton and Cora Seppin. And it was really fun to write. We're not done yet, so if you uh, want to get involved and improve this, uh, you're welcome to, to join the Squint channel on Clojurian Sl Slack. Uh, so just very briefly, uh, it contains functions like a soc and a update, etc. cetera. Uh, but how it's implemented, it, it makes like shallow copies of, of these maps, so it's not full immutability. I, get, I think this is also how Closure Script started back in the day, but this is where we are now. <laughs> so, um, yeah, next. So, uh, yeah, we have laziness, so we have functions like cycle and take and whatever. It's based on JavaScript generator functions, which uh, I'm almost out of time, so I'll uh, just to, it, it works like most of the time it works like you expect, but uh, there might be some differences, uh, caveats, because it's not the same as Closure Script. So um, you're welcome to, to ask questions in Slack and we, we can explain more. Uh, we support browser, Node, JVM, and Babeshka. So this is the compiler running in a browser. Uh, and uh, so, we're, so we say repeat foo, which is gives an infinite sequence of foo. And then we take 10 and print it. So here we see 10 times uh, the string foo. And because we treat keywords as just strings in squint, which is also a design decision that you may agree or not agree with, but that's how it works. So what about a REPL? I wrote a new closure script dialect, but what about a REPL? With a REPL, right? Uh, yeah, right? Well, yeah. So ES6 is not really REPL friendly, unfortunately, because ES6 assumes that your uh, JavaScript is a static thing. So, okay, we have a module and you import this and you export that and that never changes. And now we can optimize because you never change it. But that's not how REPL-driven uh, workflow works. You constantly change what functions are in a namespace and, and uh, if they exist or not. So, um, yeah. The gist, gist of this uh, slide is I basically ha had to hack around this uh, limitation of ES6 and make, uh, so for example, if you use dynamic import, which is the way of uh, ES6 to implement evaluation, uh, it returns a module and not a value. So you have to, to make some hook in the compiler to keep track of the last value and then you can show that in your uh, REPL. So that's what, what's happening here, for example. So we type plus one to three, and instead of generating plus one to three, I generate global this dot underscore REPL is plus one to three. So then I know what to print in the REPL, and that's the last value that you have in the REPL. So, uh, so the compiler has basically two modes. So either you're in the REPL, then we do this, or you're not in the REPL, then you get the, the more optimal output. So future work. Um, Okay, I want to improve it. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I hope I showed you a little bit that I reimagined Closure Script. I'm not sure if it's the same for you, but I hope so. Uh, I'm able to, to work on this. So Next Journal generously uh, gave me uh, time to work on these experimental Closure Script tools that I just mentioned, uh, Squint and Cherry. And uh, I'm able to do, to, to do Babeshka, CLG Condo, NBB, et cetera, with the help of all these sponsors, uh, Rome Research, Next Journal, Closure the Risk Together, at Goji, Cognitech, Kepler16, and a lot of other people and companies. Uh, if you appreciate and use my tooling in your company, you're, of course, you're welcome to sponsor. Um, and thanks, this was my talk. Any questions? Hi. Uh, thank you so much for all your tools. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask a, a slightly bigger scoped question, uh, not specifically about your talk. But I'm, I'm curious about whether there are big challenges you're seeing in the Clojure ecosystem that we're currently not aware of. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> uh, my god. Well, 
big challenges that we're not aware of. Well, I think uh, Clojure is doing very well. Uh, and um, if, if there are any challenges, then I think we should come up with a plan and do something about it. But um, I don't know concretely any, I think we're doing pretty good, <laughs> actually. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm interested that you're doing like closure script to JavaScript, uh, but all the cool kids in the JavaScript world have left and joined TypeScript. Uh. So you know, I know <laughs> <laughs> another bullshit thing to keep up with. But you know, <laughs> do we need Borktooth version two to do the TypeScript version of this, or are you are you tempted? Are you tickled by TypeScript? I'm not tickled by TypeScript. <laughs> No, but uh, yeah, I, I've looked into this uh, a little bit, but not, not very seriously. But to, if it would, if we would be able to uh, leverage TypeScript annotations for our closure script code, but I, I haven't come up with anything that that would work. And the problem with this always is that it's optional to do so, and then people probably will not really do it anyway. So. That's at least my experience with a lot of these uh, tools that you have to put er extra effort into. Uh, okay, we're, we're seeing a lot of good stuff happening with uh, Mali and Spec. Um, and uh, maybe it will inspire something, some improvements in the, this area. Who knows? But currently, I don't have anything going. Um, so you, you, you showed us that it is emitting JavaScript, plain old JavaScript. Yeah. Um, in ES modules uh, syntax, yeah. Uh, but the JavaScript world is also sort of evolving, and some parts that we as Clojure developers might like, for example, records and, and yeah. tuples and stuff. Yeah. Um, how do you sort of? Because I assume that you you target a subset, right? Yeah. How do you uh, see this sort of evolving into so the we're, future? Yeah, that's a good question. So we're uh, supporting like. Uh, we assume that you're uh, able to use uh, all the features that that it currently emits. So if you're on ES uh, 2013 or something, you might not be able to, to use the generated JavaScript. But we assume that you're using a modern JavaScript. Uh, and about the, the tuples and records, uh, that's something that I've looked into. But this proposal isn't even like. Uh, yeah, it's still in progress, so it's too early to to use it. But if it comes through Im immutable records in Clojure uh, or JavaScript, then we might be able to do something with it in in uh, Cherry, yeah, or Squint. Yeah. yeah I guess um, two things. Uh, first, I don't think I'm going to sponsor you because I already can't keep up with you everything you're doing. Oh, <laughs> so I should do less then. <laughs> <laughs> No, you're, it's, it's very much appreciated, and I think I speak for everybody even saying that. Um, and also, thanks for, especially for Joyride, because now the next time I hear Emacs or some other shit, <laughs> I, know the, I know the answer. Okay, cool. It's not a very profound question, but can you teach us the secret on how you come up with those awesome names? Because I always struggle for days. Yeah, I, I can tell you a little bit of a secret because uh, Squint was not called Squint before. It was called uh, a very bad name, and I changed it. So that's part of the secret. Um, and so just keep thinking about if every morning when you're just out of bed, read that name. And if the name, you still think that name, no, no, it really sucks, then change it. Well, not really a question, more of a statement, but all of this reminds me of people trying to run Doom everywhere. Oh! And, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Clojure so, um, is my Doom. Yeah. yeah, please keep going, because I really would like to run Clojure on my microwave. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Does it support JavaScript? It probably will. Given that you're doing a new language and you get to make choices in these things, um, First, I, I guess in two questions, if you've declared a function to be async, yeah. in the majority of cases, are you anticipating calling it as, uh, with await? Uh, 
No, I'm not anticipating anything. Uh, okay. So, so uh, what, maybe I can show uh, live in, uh, what happens if you compile. My uh, questioning there is, uh, I mean, if you uh, don't call it with a wait, you're going to get a promise back. Yeah, I, I can't show it. Uh, it's not working. But, but a so, lot of the time when you're calling an async method, it's to call it with a wait. Yeah, yeah. But uh, you, you want to be able to call it with a wait. Yeah. And in that case, you could flip around the, um, because you're choosing the language here, yeah. you could flip around your syntax. So if you've declared it as async, it'll automatically await when you call it, no. unless you had yeah, something that, else to call that's, it with. That's not, no, you, I think we should stay close to how people write, write it in JavaScript, because else you get unpredictable, uh, confusing results. Um, and so recently I saw an example where you had to declare a function in React uh, async, while you're not doing any await, for example. And we want to be able to support that as well. So um, we're not going to make any like clever tricks to, to make things more easy. We're just going to translate it straightforwardly to, to JavaScript, basically. That, that's the idea. Um, yeah. So you mentioned that you changed the na what you named something yeah. <laughs> based on <laughs> it being um, compliant with CLJ Condo. I'm now wondering how much of our closure universe <laughs> <laughs> this, this pesky little convenience leaks into. And everybody else should think about it too. So I'm, there's no question there for you. I oh, just. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I was I going to ask. Yeah. I mean, I guess there is if you want to answer. But yeah, I mean, how much well, does you your can work? Well, you can configure CLJ Condo to okay declare like okay there there isn't actually an, there is mm -hmm. actually an, a wait mm -hmm. so that's not a problem for uh, but uh, since I'm I'm making an experimental tool things yeah. are not like uh, set in stone yet I don't want to make any decisions upfront uh, about it if I don't have to I think it's a val that's a valuable insight to your development process that's the second time in this yes about the, the how you name things and you said I put a temporary name, then I don't like it, I figure it out, which is very much, to me, similar to what you just said. So, hmm, interesting yeah. insight into the mind of Michiel. Michiel. But I'm not your guru. <laughs> 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 Yay! Second bite at the cherry, okay. Um, yeah, uh, what's the interest from the JavaScript community? Because I think that's, a, yeah. you know, that's maybe it would be a way to bring more JavaScript developers in. I think that's what yeah. you're... Maybe well, what your goal is, but I'll yeah. stop and let you answer now. Okay. Yeah, uh, that, that's a good question. Um, I think there are some people who are like on the with one step inside the closure script ecosystem and one step in, into the JavaScript ecosystem. Those people might be interested with like staying on board for uh, for for some tools that they make uh, before going with JavaScript, um, but. I don't know if you've seen the talk by Jack Rusher, Stop uh, Writing Dead Programs. I think a lot of JavaScript developers are still in that mode of development. Like uh, TypeScript, I think, also encourages that, that mode of development. You write your program, all the types align, and then you run it. OK, it doesn't work. Let's start over. Uh, and I, I think if Squint has a good REPL and people uh, get more of, of like the REPL-oriented workflow, we might get, uh, win some of those people to to that side, um, but if you're really into like the compile run cycle with static types, then we're not going to to win those people over to closure anyway. So I think that that's the key element to uh, people should uh, uh, maybe be made aware of of this other world that we're having here in in closure script with dynamic. Uh, uh, runtimes and uh, programs that run while you develop. I'm just uh, wondering um, that uh, Cherry and the technology you uh, present to us is uh, using a JavaScript and uh, in a CLJS. And uh, I am wondering, it uh, keep uh, rolling in my head, uh, that uh, it's for more, more for people who are uh, writing in uh, JavaScript and uh, trying to switch it to ClojureScript. But uh, do ClojureScript 
originally uh, need to escape from the JavaScript implementation it, uh, in uh, its code on the, you know, like, to escape uh, JavaScript at all while uh, development. C can you uh, summarize the question once more? Uh, do CLJS need to escape uh, JavaScript implementation I in its code? Uh, do you mean like, do we have to add support for async await to ClojureScript itself, for example, or? Um, no, I mean that uh, on the presentation on the screens, I saw that uh, Mike Macros says uh, about the GS6 and uh, JS, and uh, maybe the ClojureScript needs to escape all this thing and uh, try to uh, write a clean, like uh, clean closed script code without the J JavaScript, or it's an it's an impossible. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure what you <laughs> intend to to ask. Sorry. Um, okay, so one more try. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is the last one. So okay. Are, are, do you mean that we should target a different language than JavaScript? Uh, not 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 we. Uh, we cannot we, escape JavaScript. That, that's a given. <laughs> ah, okay, okay. <laughs> this, about escaping this. GSX literals oh. within the within the code. You you mentioned that you have to escape them, but now with this you don't need to. Yes, yes. Yeah, it's kind of oh. kind of tricky because um, because we don't need to use it, but uh, we just implemented this. You know, like it's kind of strange for me, but, uh, but it's okay. Okay, so you, you were expecting that we had to escape it before uh, it worked, or? Yeah, uh, no, I think that the uh, closure script uh, maybe don't need but should to escape from the, this uh, JavaScript thing, like okay. into uh, closure, closure uh, side, you know. Okay, yeah, we, we can have a chat later after the, during yeah, the Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. thank you, I like to. <laughs> <laughs> I think that, yeah. that, that, that Thank you. makes me more open to your... <laughs>